On February 16th, 1932, a London Daily Express headline reads, Raid on Valentino's Tomb, Body Snatching Plot Suspected. The following article was a true story, with the plot unfolding this way. Mr. Walter B. Ridgway, a local florist working in the Hollywood Cemetery, first spotted a man, a foreign type, he later said, who seemed out of place. Ridgway recalled the man as being rough-looking and poorly dressed. The man said he was looking for Valentino's crypt, and Ridgway pointed the way. Florist Ridgway would later tell reporters that the following week he saw the same man come and go with four other rough-looking men as they skulked about Valentino's crypt. The coverage in the London Express continued, quote, Ghouls were suspected of planning to steal the body of Rudolph Valentino for commercial reasons. The five men discovered scoping out the marble house of the dead had every intention of opening that vault, sliding Valentino's silver coffin out of the crypt, and opening the lid. Because that is what grave robbers do. Were they actually intending to steal Valentino's body? Or were they after something else? Were they after Valentino's platinum slave bracelet? Considering Valentino's closest friend and trusted business manager George Ullman revealed the bracelet's location in his 1926 book, claiming it was buried with Valentino, it's fair to assume the grave robbers probably read Ullman's book, but their presence prompted the cemetery to hire a security guard for Valentino's tomb. Whether the ensuing legend of Valentino being buried with his slave bracelet was based in fantasy, just a romantic myth, or whether it was the absolute truth, for 96 years that bracelet has lived a life of its own. With each passing year, it gained a mythical power over Valentino's fans and most specifically enticed the Valentino memorabilia collectors. Within the past few weeks, collectors have been chatting online about that slave bracelet and its whereabouts. Perhaps they got wind of this podcast, who knows, but they were out in force. Is it not a slippery, slippery slope for them to even mention the subject of the slave bracelet? For almost immediately, in any conversation about Valentino's slave bracelet, the question is posed, where is it now? I will not claim to have an answer to that question, but I will add to the lore of the bracelet today by sharing some insight and documentation on the subject in an effort to hopefully someday answer that question. Today, Renato and I delve into the missing, or perhaps not so missing, Valentino sleigh bracelet, that Christmas gift so loved long ago which would become the holy grail of Valentino collectibles. Ciao, I am Renato Flores, the very proud publisher of all the groundbreaking and documented publication on Rudolf Valentino and Natasha Rambova, by Evelyn Zumaya Flores, Aurelio Micoli, Michael Morris, Baltasar Fernandez Que, Jean de Recville, George Ullman, and Robert Flore. I am here today with Evelyn to talk more about our fascinating work. Ciao, Evelyn! Ciao, Renato! So Valentino's infamous slave bracelet. What a controversial symbol of the man himself. Why controversial? It is generally presumed the controversy was because men did not wear bracelets then. But I think the controversy can also be explained because his wife Natasha gave it to him as a Christmas present. To set this within historical context, in 1924, despite women gaining the right to vote some years earlier, wives were pretty much still chattel. 
A wife giving her husband a slave bracelet to wear was scandalous, if only in the implication. Did this not mean he was her slave? It's hard to even imagine the mentality in such thinking, but at the time a husband wearing a slave bracelet his wife gave him was an admission of a culturally unaccepted love life where the woman made her husband wear a restraint. But in 1924, that was conservative thinking. And for Rudolf and Natasha Valentino, being young, wealthy, and extravagant, the bracelet was not such an unusual gift. They indulged in collecting a great deal of expensive jewelry. And yes, it was on Christmas morning of 1924 when Natasha gave Rudolph the platinum chain bracelet of her own design. He, of course, loved it by all reports, and he gave her a diamond wristwatch, which by all accounts she loved. The custom of wearing jewelry was for sure a part of Valentino's childhood and Catholic imprinting. As you explained to me, Renato, at the time of a child's baptism in Italy, the padrino or godfather and the madrina, godmother, gave the child a gift of the catenina or little chain, a gold necklace, something worn by the young boy as a sign of a family's social and financial standing. It was also typical to give a child a bracelet at the time of their confirmation. Now, in the 1950s, I remember that we knew who the Catholic boys were because they wore that gold necklace. As an adult, Valentino still wore jewelry, considered unusual for the day by American standards, and he wore bracelets before Christmas of 1924, which was often commented on in the press. For example, from the Standard Union, Brooklyn, New York, on December 9, 1923, and I quote, Valentino wears bracelet as he sails for France. Rudolf Valentino departed for France on the Cunard liner Aquitania yesterday. He will spend the Christmas holidays with his mother and father-in-law at Nice. Dressed in his usual sporty manner, the erstwhile chic wore a spiked platinum bracelet. In reply to queries as to the reason for this rather unnecessary ornament to a man's person, Rudolph reluctantly declared that he had no intention of divulging its significance. However, he admitted that he does not sleep with it and changes it nightly before retiring with another bracelet of gold." End quote. So, when and how did this slave bracelet become so controversial? Renato Valentino was a trendsetter, and his legions of fans followed his every sartorial whim. When he began wearing stiletto sideburns for his role in Blood and Sand, so did half the male population of the United States under, say, 25 years of age. So, of course, when he began wearing Natasha's slave bracelet, it caught on like the proverbial wildfire. Reproductions were spun off, assembly lines, and young men and women could buy one for as little as 98 cents, according to an ad which appeared in the Knoxville News Sentinel. Other promotions sold them for $4.50 and $18. The Valentino bracelet furor, in my opinion, did not really ignite controversy until an anonymously written editorial appeared in the Chicago Tribune in July of 1926, just a few weeks before Valentino's death. Because the editorial articulated and threw directly in Valentino's face something which was already becoming a hot issue at the time. This being the male establishment's fury over Valentino's revolutionary and challenging fashion influence. The anonymous editorial blamed Valentino for being a nefarious influence because of the appearance of pink powder vending machines in men's bathrooms. The editorial distilled one aspect of the campaign to ruin and demean Valentino, by saying his wearing such a bracelet meant he was gay. Their argument was that gay was bad, bracelets were for ladies, and heaved all the innuendo on Valentino for being an effeminate influence on young men. Valentino was deeply angered by the Chicago Tribune editorial, 
and George Allman attributed Valentino's death on the anguish, saying it caused him so much distress he did not have the strength to fend off the fatal infection. During the last weeks of Valentino's life, the slave bracelet became a battleground for his very identity. At a time when he was freshly divorced from Natasha, the bracelet must have triggered sorrow and love for him, but it was noted in the press he continued to wear it. This said the policing of gender by his detractors over that bracelet and its influence became more aggressive after that editorial. Valentino's reply to the editorial further set the bracelet in the historical moment when he wrote, and I quote, Hoping I will have the opportunity to demonstrate to you that the wrist under a slave bracelet may snap a real fist into your sagging jaw and that I may teach you respect of a man even though he happens to prefer to keep his face clean, I remain with utter contempt, Rudolph Valentino, end quote. The bracelet was subsequently mentioned in nearly every article about Valentino's challenge to the author of the editorial, and in many instances it made the headline. To his detractors, it became a weaponized, tangible, homophobic slur. When Valentino died, his earthly remains were and have since been subjected to intense focus, with a particular and fervent interest in the whereabouts of his slave bracelet. As the last woman to see Valentino alive, his first wife, Jean Acker, was asked if Valentino died wearing the slave bracelet. One headline in the Daily News read, quote, Sheik on sickbed linked to Jean by slave bracelet. And in the Times Union, Brooklyn, New York, dated August 24, 1926, uh, I quote, Miss Acker was asked about a report that when Valentino died, he wore on one of his arms a slave bracelet, which was a gift from her. She said, I did give him a bracelet, but I don't know whether he wore it because I could not see his arm, end quote. Uh, why she thought that would fly is still a mystery to me. After Valentino's death, the value of those relics seemed to have served a different purpose than just collecting. Uh, yes, Renato. There was then nearly no trade in memorabilia. The value of an item was calculated literally as, for example, a shirt was a shirt. The task of liquidating Valentino's belongings fell to George Ullman who was appointed executor of his estate. And while Valentino owned a king's ransom and fabulous things and property, he died relatively cash poor, in between movie contracts and deeply in debt. Executor Ullman and Valentino were not only business partners, I would say, but close friends, and Ullman was devastated by Rudolph's death. Nevertheless, he began the exhaustive organization of the star's material belongings in order to convert them into funds and clear Valentino's nearly $1 million of debt. Now, there are two points to be made in regards to this time frame in the history of the slave bracelet's journey into oblivion and George Allman. One, Allman's book, Valentino as I Knew Him, which was published shortly after Valentino's death, and two, the estate auction. Now, regarding Allman's 1926 book, I was privileged to have located and interviewed Allman's two children when I researched my biography of Valentino, Affairs Valentino. They granted me exclusive access to their father's archive and also to their father's second memoir written in 1975, which was never published until you published it, Renato. Yes. Ullman's children related to me detailed accounts of how their father penned the 1926 book manuscript on Valentino's funeral train as it headed from New York City back to Los Angeles with Valentino's body. They said their mother told them how their father secluded himself on the long train ride and wrote, and I quote Valentino as I knew him. In the year that Rudy passed away, I wrote a book, rather hurriedly, I'm afraid, so that the many thousands of his admirers could have at least an honest, although brief biography quickly 
because I knew that a great amount of fiction and inaccurate accounts would soon be published, which indeed did happen." End quote. When George Ullman arrived in Los Angeles, he gave the manuscript to an editor to turn into a polished book. It has long been asserted the book was ghostwritten. It was not. It was edited. If the analysis is made, comparing Ullman's writing styles in the 1926 manuscript and his 1975 manuscript, it's clear to see they are of the same hand. Ullman wrote in signature short paragraphs, which often consist of one long run-on sentence. Now, Ullman's 1926 book is relevant to the slave bracelet narrative, because it was there he stated the slave bracelet was buried with Valentino. It is alleged this was a mistake, and proof he did not write his own book because there were other mistakes in the book, such as a mislabeled photo. But in appreciating the content of this remarkable book, we must take into account Allman's credibility, because he would have known. This was a statement made by S. George Allman, a man who loved Valentino like a brother, who worked hard and rehabilitated his career who was a serious family man, and the person who stood at Valentino's deathbed, heard his last word, and delivered Valentino's final wardrobe to the funeral home. George Ullman was widely respected, and he would have known exactly where that slave bracelet was. No one doubted his statement until recently when I defined Ullman as the hero of Valentino's story, and our detractors seized the moment. Ullman's statement the bracelet was buried with Valentino is disputed by collectors today, and they present their proof as being gospel. But I looked a bit further into their proof and have some contributions to add and a few other possible scenarios. Ullman organized the auction of Valentino's estate and the bracelet was listed in the auction catalog. Yes, Renato, a bracelet was itemized in the auction book, item number 727, and I quote, 727, one original Valentino slave bracelet, solid platinum links. This is the famous design introduced by Mr. Valentino in America and worn by him at all times, approximately two and a half ounces of pure platinum, end quote. So just a week or so ago, collectors admitted there were four copies made of the slave bracelet. They were not so clear about when they were made. But the collectors today argue the original bracelet was not buried with Valentino because it was listed in that catalog. They allege Ullman did not write his book and that a ghostwriter simply made a mistake saying the bracelet was buried with Valentino. I contend, as an aside, that it is a habit of collectors to deny any proof but theirs and that it was not a mistake at all. What do I present as my documentation for my making this statement? The following, and this brings us to the subject of George Ullman and the auction. In 2003, I was in search of documents to substantiate the facts of the settlement of Valentino's estate. Because of my involvement in the Ullman executorship story, I felt this required my having access to the original probate case file. I discovered the entire case file was stolen from its rightful housing and subsequently embarked on a search for any copies. I located 1,000 pages of that file, officially hand copied, and filed in the California State Appeals Archive. There, the case of George Allman's Appeals Court records was still on file. Now, within that file, I found extracts of a court ordered audit of Ullman's Valentino accounting. And for the purposes of illustrating my point here, I cite Detail 9, Baskerville Audit, which was a court-ordered audit, items advanced Marie Guglielmi Strada by the executor, George Ullman, as transcribed from the records. And we have in this list 
set cabochon emerald and platinum cufflinks, $775. Cabochon sapphire ring, $1,000. Cabochon emerald ring, $700. And white gold cigarette case, $125, etc. Now these items, which Omen advanced to Valentino's sister Maria, with her name Marie being a clerical misspelling in the records, of which there are many, I might add, these items were listed for sale in the auction catalog. For example, we have item number 714, one set of cabochon emerald and platinum cufflinks, uh, which he advanced to Maria. Item number 716, one unusual gold cigarette case and one cabochon sapphire ring. These items, which were listed at auction, would not be for sale to the public, obviously. So why would Oman not delete those items from the catalog? Was this because logistically the catalog had already gone to print? Was Oman just pressing forward to pay the bills? And it was not a problem for him because those people who would benefit from any sale, Alberto Valentino and Sister Maria Strada, they already had those items in their possession. The fact was, items listed were removed from sale by Executor Ullman and given directly to Valentino's sister Maria. Now, in Ullman's official tally of the auction sales, he cites that the item 727, the slave bracelet, was purchased by Valentino's brother Alberto for $550. According to the court records, Alberto did not purchase things from the auction. He charged them against what they all then believed was his settlement from his brother's estate. As it turned out, Alberto was not a legal heir, and this left the subject of those advanced items, i.e. jewelry and that slave bracelet, in question. Of course we know, as I wrote about in Affairs Valentino, Almond should never have advanced Alberto or Maria even a sock. And in the course of the subsequent litigation brought against him by Valentino's brother Alberto, Almond would be required to repay the estate, Alberto and sister Maria, for the value of all those items he allowed them to take. More about that insanity in Affairs Valentino. But the point here I make today is that because the original slave bracelet was listed at auction does not mean it was on sale to the public. However, we do know only that a bracelet was for sale, as reported in news articles of the day. Why would Omen then describe this one as being original? Because it was owned by Valentino. And as it is also known, Omen did all he could to maximize sales for obvious commercial reasons. That was his job. Omen was smart as far as trying to turn the household into cash to pay off the debt and close out the estate. Even handyman Lou Mahoney testified what a good job Omen did keeping everyone fed. He did all he could to maximize the value of the collections, the armor, Valentino's yacht, his books. The collectors today imply, if not state, that Ullman was doing this to make money for himself. How could he? There were many people involved in the auction, the sale, the accounting, and all of the books were examined in a court-ordered audit and found to be in perfect order. So was this the original bracelet? Or a copy. We know Valentino had a wristwatch made with a similar chain because he was photographed wearing both at once. But I think there is another insight into item 727 as to whether it was the original bracelet or a copy, and this involves the price of the one set at auction. According to Comparative Table of Values, as published in the Salt Lake Telegram on June 27, 1926, the value then of platinum was $331.70 for 0.61 cubic inch of the metal. This was one ounce. With the bracelet advertised as being two and a half ounces, the price which was set at $550 is too low and covers barely the cost of the metal.
the cost of just the base metal would have been $829.25. So you believe the bracelet sold at the auction was not the original? I don't believe it was. I believe it was a copy. And over the years, many claims were made about those copies. Just a few interesting examples. From the Seattle Star, September 14, 1935, and I quote, Valentino bracelet for sale. For sale by a Fifth Avenue shop, one platinum sleeve bracelet made in Italy. Ten years ago, an offer of $10,000 for it was refused. But owing to rapid depreciation in sentimental value, will sacrifice for $350. Original owner was a motion picture actor named Rudolph Valentino. And in the Chicago Tribune on April 39th, 1936, we have, and I quote, Valentino bracelet will be worn at University of Chicago show. A bracelet formerly belonging to the late Rudolph Valentino screen star will be used by the leading lady in the show tomorrow night and Saturday, which will be staged at Mandel Hall by the Blackfriars Men's Dramatic Society at the University of Chicago. The bracelet of twisted silver will be worn by Jean Davis. The title of the show is Fascist and Furious. And also in the Miami Herald, May 4th, 1929, in an article called Along Broadway, it's reported someone named Joe Herman of New York owned the original slave bracelet. Now over time, a great silence began to surround that bracelet. It seemed to vanish completely. Did Alberto Valentino ever mention he owned it? No, he did not. And I base this statement on the following. In 2003, I interviewed a gentleman, then renowned as the most prominent Valentino collector. I knew while interviewing him that if he did not have something in his collection, he would ask me if I knew anything about it. For example, I knew he did not have Valentino's toupee or the undershirt Valentino was wearing when he was admitted to the hospital before he died because he asked me about it. I knew this collector did not have photographs of Valentino's embalmed body because he asked me to see if the funeral home still had them. His questions or no questions revealed a great deal. And if he did not want to talk about something, he would pause with a sphinx-like smile and change the subject. I did ask him if he owned Valentino's slave bracelet and he changed the subject. Enough said for me. He did not answer that it was buried with Valentino or that it was sold at auction. But which bracelet did he have? Why was he hiding it? If it were the bracelet Alberto Valentino bought at auction, the collector would have told me about it. Every interview I had with him began with a show and tell of Valentino relics from his collection. I was allowed to hold Valentino's personal address book, a watch given to him or sold to him by Alberto, the dagger from the son of the sheik, Valentino's leather box of collars. So where was the bracelet? I knew he had it, but the subject was closed and I knew not to push too hard. This collector acquired his collection of Valentino memorabilia from many people he knew who knew Valentino. Ah, uh, yes, Gene Acker, Alberto and Jean Valentino, George Ullman. And these people, of course, had valuable collections, which the collector ended up owning. So I wondered how this collector could have the sleigh bracelet if it was, as Ullman claimed, buried with Valentino. And if it was purchased by Alberto, how did the collector come to have it? And why was the collector not bragging about owning it? as he did with the rest of his collection. Now I add here that I was introduced to this collector by my great friend, Father Michael Morris. In 2003, I met Father Michael Morris, an iconic and highly respected Valentino scholar. We became close friends and he a valuable mentor to me over the years I wrote Affairs Valentino. Michael and I shared 15 years of conversations about our subjects, Rudolph Valentino and Natasha Rumbova, before he passed away in 2016. 
One day, we discussed the whereabouts of the slave bracelet, and he told me quite casually he thought the original was taken out of the crypt. I reacted with disbelief at the mere thought Valentino's crypt could have ever been compromised. Michael reacted to my disbelief by adding, oh, it's easy. You just slide the marble plaque off and there you are. I did not ask him why he thought that or if he knew more about it. In hindsight, I wish I had. To me, then, it seemed too implausible collectors would go that far. But they do, as I would learn, and I cite science.howstuffworks backslash environmental backslash earth backslash archaeology backslash archaeology grave robbing. And I quote, In the classic adventure movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, the bulk of the action comes when Professor Adventure Archaeologist Indiana Jones battles grave robbing Nazis for the Lost Ark of the Covenant. In the film, director Steven Spielberg draws a distinct line between the intent of the movie's hero and the intent of his money-hungry foil, Dr. René Belloc. Belloc is depicted as the anti-Indiana Jones, an archaeologist who has lost his way and given in to the temptations of becoming a treasure hunter for hire. Take a close look at the film's title, though. It's not called The Legitimate Archaeologist and the Grave Robber. According to the title, they're all Raiders of the Lost Ark. This begs the question, where is the line drawn between archaeology and grave robbing? End quote. Was Father Morris right about some treasure hunters being raiders of Valentino's tomb? Did some tough-looking, poorly-dressed men eventually manage to rob Valentino's grave for commercial reasons and reap a fortune from a collector for that original bracelet? The subterfuge continues surrounding the location of the slave bracelet, with a collector just recently saying, quote, It is not with the family, and I will leave it at that, end quote. I ask, why leave it at that? What more do you know, sir? And the same collector saying emphatically they knew as fact it was not buried with Valentino. How did they know that? They cite the auction sale as proof. But as I pointed out, this is proof of nothing. They cite a bracelet being under guard at the auction. But what bracelet? after they admitted copies were made. Did Alberto sell his copy listed as item 727 to the collector? Today, certain collectors own and even wear slave bracelet copies. And for me, this nouveau popularizing of that bracelet is not just a fad, but an unsavory element in the Valentino legacy. The fetishizing of the Valentino bracelet is most notoriously embraced by those few collectors who are vocal proponents of the long-dismissed idea that Valentino was gay. Why does this bear even a mention? Because the bracelet was exploited by Valentino's enemies to demean him with homophobic slurs and levy an accusation of effeminacy, something he rejected vehemently by continuing to defiantly wear it. I think it interjects this sore subject in an odd way and makes one wonder, where is the original bracelet? It is kind of flaunting of the effeminacy issue and a flaunting of the original bracelet's disappearance. I would ask these collectors how they are so sure as to where the bracelet is not. If Alberta did buy it at auction, then why does the family not have it? as a collector said with his afterthought of, I'll leave it at that. With an investment in the commercial value of the artifacts, a collector's word should be received with some critical apprehension and their role in the narrative recognized. They are not such objective historians. Michael Morris called the collector I interviewed the Sphinx, and I say best to recognize the sphinx-like speak of collectors, and I will leave it at that. Where do I think the bracelet is now? I would say, who knows? I don't know, but I think they, those collectors, sure do know. Maybe in 50 to 100 years it will surface. But perhaps 
It already has. Maybe those collectors should have all the slave bracelets laying about, verified by curators who can date the metal and pinpoint that. Who knows? For we are to take their word and not question. But the secrecy and subterfuge surrounding the subject speaks loudly of something to hide, some shady history they are suppressing. Whether original or copies, it all belongs in a museum under the care of professional curators and in facilities which can guarantee the preservation and conservatorship they deserve. It is to me tragic that Valentino's belongings are hoarded to use as display, used to elevate a collector's status with Valentino followers, and in our case used as a source of ammunition to silence a critic. It is a practice at this time for one of the collectors to reward faithful followers by letting them wear Valentino's ring for a while. Uh, yes, how outrageous is that, Renato? Do they also parade around wearing Valentino's shirts and play fight with the prop dagger from Son of the Sheik? As you well know, Renato, during our research, we found so many Valentino-related documents missing. Most of his personal archive, his correspondence, professional documents are now buried in private collections to be bartered about and sold off on eBay into oblivion. And in regards to the subject of this episode and the fate of the slave bracelet, I contend, after researching this story, reading the news of the day, after having access to the court records, to Omen's personal archive, and much more, I believe that original bracelet was buried with him and could well have been removed at some point, and in my opinion, in the 1950s. Why? I base that statement on the following. I learned while researching Affairs Valentino that in the 1950s the entire case file of probate records of Rudolph Guglielmi Valentino was stolen from its rightful housing in the Los Angeles County Hall of Records. I also learned from the collector I interviewed that Jean Acker's Valentino materials were stolen from her home. I also know from Almond's children and the collector that two wicker crates containing all of Almond's Rudolph Valentino's business papers were stolen from his garage in this same time frame. Did the same person who masterminded those daring heists pay a few rough-looking men to grab the ultimate prize? Michael Morris was right to call the bracelet the Holy Grail. Yes, Renato, he was. It is remarkable the high degree of subterfuge which now surrounds the bracelet's location, the secrecy which is still so obvious even in the collector's words as they admitted they knew it was not with the family and added, and I quote, I'll just leave it at that. Today again I call for that holy grail and all of Valentino memorabilia to be housed in a museum, all of it. Rudolph Valentino deserves, in the very least, professional guardianship of his legacy and not a cryptic narrative bespeaking activities of a black market. May I suggest that out of respect for the dearly departed, that in the minimum these particular people cease using the slave bracelet, a gift of love from Natasha to Rudolph so long ago, for personal display. It bears mentioning here that those who typically wear their Valentino slave bracelet copies are the same people who consistently vilify Natasha Rombova, erroneously blaming this fabulously talented woman Valentino loved and respected, blaming her for everything, while alleging her marriage to Valentino was a fraud, arranged, platonic, a lavender marriage, as we know it was not. Despite their false narrative, I feel the legend of the slave bracelet has endured in great measure because Ullman told the story back in 1926, the story of a gift of great affection and received by two people deeply in love. Yet today, the subject of Valentino's slave bracelet is inherently intertwined with the ethic of the collector and this subject of homosexuality. But I would like to believe that thankfully we have evolved as a human race to a degree where trivializing homophobia as a fashion statement is no longer acceptable. 
and antiquated stereotypes are, well, rejected. By the hour of Valentino's death, I contend the bracelet had become his crucifix, something of profound personal significance for him, and it is depressing to see it, or a copy, being flaunted as a costume prop to wear about the man's crypt. In closing, I want to thank all of our listeners who keep us inspired. And once more, I say I hope you will read all our books, which we are so eager to share. They are all online and not so hard to find. And hear much more about the Pink Powder Puff editorial in our podcast on this channel titled Rudolph Valentino and the Pink Powder Puff Reveal. And for today, as the usual, I say Fiat Justitia Ruat Celum. And for the good, good guys, Arrivederci.